This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry, is brought to you by Case IH. Coming up on this weekend's broadcast, some tough economics for the pork industry in the week of the Pork Expo. Hello, everyone. We welcome you to the broadcast here. Mr. Pearson, you were with the pork producers. And it struck me, listening to you as you were talking about the Pork Expo, they don't stay in trouble very long, but it's a rough spot now, isn't it? It is a rough spot indeed in the pork industry. Max had the chance to visit the Iowa State Fair in Des Moines last week to talk with pork producers at the expo, and I had the chance to check in with Trish Cook. She's the president of the Iowa Pork Producers Association, first woman to ever lead that organization. And we talked about the impact that this market is having on Iowa producers. You know, it's been a really interesting time frame being a pork producer. You know, we had some really great profits in the last couple of years. Now we're experiencing much higher input costs and lower prices that we're getting paid at the market. So it's definitely creating challenges to be a pork producer in Iowa right now. On top of all of that, we had the recent Supreme Court case of Proposition 12. How's that impacting the Iowa pork producers? Yeah, unfortunately, the Proposition 12 SCOTUS opinion did not go the way that we hoped as Iowa pork producers. So there's a lot of questions now. Is there going to be enough pork to supply California? Um, people have asked me on our farm, because we're a farrow to finish farm, are we transitioning to Prop 12 housing? and we are not on our farm. Um, there's a lot of talk about what's the payback, can you even make it work? Because right now the capital expenditure to do that would be millions of dollars and we're losing $30 a head on stuff that's going to market. So it's pretty tough to get excited about a large capital expenditure when you're not making any money. Looking out into the markets, Trish, does it appear that the, uh, the fortunes might change for the hog industry? You know, things that I always look to see for bright lights is um, potential new markets we can tap to export. Um, one area that I've just heard highlighted this morning is about in the Caribbean area. There is a free trade agreement with about 10 countries that the equivalent population of those 10 countries is Mex the same as Mexico. And if you follow pork exports at all, you know that Mexico has been a bright light in our industry, buying so much, not just hams, primarily hams, but they've been buying a lot of volume of, of U.S. pork. So um, we always are appreciative of our trading partners um, like, like that and, and look forward to finding new ones, as well as also just always trying to to keep domestic demand as high as we can and stimulating consumers. And it's, it's exciting in the summer because everyone wants to throw some pork on the grill. And so we're really hoping for a great domestic um, use this summer. For those domestic consumers, anything exciting in the world of pork that you're excited about, Trish? Well, I always just get excited about pork because it's so versatile and there's just so many ways you can cook it and enjoy it. And I just, I just love to talk to people about, you know, don't overcook it and here's a way to do it. And one thing that I had not cooked for a long time, except maybe the last five years, is just like, like get a pork butt, either slow cook it in, in your oven or in a crock pot or on a smoker. And it's just going to be a meal that you can enjoy for many meals because it's so tender and juicy and you can really make it last. That's so true. Trish, did you have fun at the World Pork Expo this year? Yeah, it's always great to come to Expo and just talk with other producers that maybe you don't see all the time and talk with people that we do business with that we maybe communicate mostly with email or text. Um, and now we can just be in person and, and maybe meet them at a hospitality tent and just have a great conversation. That was Trish Cook, president of the Iowa Pork Producers Association, and conversations abounded throughout the World Pork Expo about how that industry could find ways to rebuild its profit margin. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. The Firestone Ag Dealer Network offers you the support, inventory, and resources you need. Visit FirestoneAg.com to find your local certified dealer. And it's time to talk markets. Joining us this week is Dennis Smith of Archer Financial Services. And Dennis, the record run in the live and feeder cattle market continues. That's exciting to see, isn't it? Oh, we're seeing a lot of action, a lot of volatility, record high cash steer prices, uh, feeder cattle prices through the roof, uh, wild volatility, uh, key reversals in place yesterday. Does that mean a major top? No, I don't think so. We're still looking for a higher cash steer market to develop yet this week, and we'll see how that 
if that stabilizes the futures markets, but it's just getting started, Mike. And the cash trade we're talking about, Dennis, is $190 in the north per hundredweight. That is a record price, right, for cash yeah, cattle? That's a record high price. That's $300 dressed. And uh, the, the Southern Plains, uh, they're facing a 181 bid, last I knew. But uh, my sources are telling me it's going to take a 184 to 185 to buy those cattle this week. We'll see. And yet, Dennis, the futures market is consistently underperforming cash. June is in delivery. How do you see that interaction developing as, as this goes on? We should see the June contract continue to grind upward toward that cash market. There's been no deliveries. None are expected. The oldest long is now in early January. Uh, then August takes over the, the lead contract, and it should begin to find some traction working upward. So, yeah, the, the live cattle board it's a consistent discount, but uh, at some point, that's probably going to change. So how are we handling this? Record prices, Dennis, is this a time to get hedges on in the live cattle? We are not actively hedging in the live cattle futures market. I'm not saying that we that'll stay uh, remain the case by by mid to late summer. We might get more active in hedging, but it'll be concentrated in the options. I'm not interested in selling a futures board at a sharp discount. That makes sense, Dennis. But what's the risk out there with record high cattle prices? Well, the risk is uh, I would say the number one risk is recession or threat of recession. But that does not look imminent right now, at least for the rest of this year. The economy continues to do very well. And now that we've seen this record cash cattle price pushing into the retail counter, Dennis, how's that consumer holding up? Are wholesale boxes staying up there? Wholesale boxes are strong. In fact, the leverage is now swung from the, the packer to the feedlot at, at the cash steer level. But now the packers are swinging the leverage at their wholesale retail level. They're asking higher prices for beef and they're getting it because demand for U.S. beef is so very strong. Dennis, with record high cash prices, are exports at risk? Yeah, uh, beef exports are down 9% this year, and as wholesale beef prices continue to rise, yeah, beef exports will slow down. But keep in mind, we're comparing exports with a good export year uh, last year. And those values are still very strong, so the folks buying the exports are at least paying the higher prices, it would seem. You bet. So far, there's been a very little pushback noted in the export market. Dennis, are we hearing feedlots fill up? Are these prices doing what they're supposed to be doing to the market? No, we're not seeing that. We're going to continue to see placements drop, and, and the whole new thing developing is the rain in the southern plains. That's going to provide a plentiful grass, and it's going to keep cattle on grass longer, reducing placements. It's definitely going to have an impact on the feeder cattle market, and Dennis, we're going to pick your brain on that market when we return. Folks, stay here for more markets on This Week in Agribusiness. This portion of This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Firestone Ag. Harvey Firestone invented the first pneumatic farm tire, forever changing what it means to farm hard. Visit FirestoneAg.com to learn more about this history and tire solutions for today. We're talking markets this week with Dennis Smith of Archer Financial Services. And Dennis, that record run on cash prices exists in the live cattle market, also exists in the feeder cattle market. How are you handling the risk in feeders? Yeah, feeders have been red hot and the board's very strong. Feeder futures are different than the live cattle futures. They are holding a huge premium to the feeder index. So there's a market we are interested in hedging, but we're also interested in leaving the upside open. So put spreads is our strategy there. Establishing a price floor fairly close to current prices or fairly close to the, to the market in, in contract prices and leaving the upside open. Open. Dennis, the feeder index, substantial discount to futures, as you mentioned, but every report I see of a sale out there in the countryside, the feeders are record hot. Why isn't that index moving up faster? What's happening is the, the real strong prices are for the lightweight animals and, and animals uh, under 700 pounds, and that's not part of the CME feeder index. The feeder index is, is comprised of 700 to 850 pound animals. All right, so you are putting some 
some put spreads in place. How far out are you looking to capture some of these high prices? Right now we're going out as far as October, really not going out further than that. You mentioned, Dennis, the rain in the Southern Plains. Finally, after three years, we're seeing some green grass in the pastures. How does that impact this industry as we get through summer? It could be a game changer if it persists, and it sure looks like it's going to. But interesting, Mike, the cow slaughter and the percent of heifers in the slaughter mix still remains very high. So we're still in a liquidation phase as far as the beef cattle numbers, uh, the beef cow numbers. But uh, that will change if the Southern Plains uh, uh, has plentiful grass through the summer season. All right, but in the interim, that tightness in supply is going to be here for a little while longer, it sounds like. We're looking at a lower beef production next year and the year following and possibly the year following that. Lots to keep an eye on in the cattle market. Dennis, let's turn our focus to the hogs. World Pork Expo going on this week. Sounds like some hog producers might have a reason to smile. Well, we'll see. We've had a nice rally on the board. Uh, it's a, a, a nice upside correction in a bear market. Uh, we're, we're thinking it's probably about run its course, but uh, we've got a lot of issues in front of us. Uh, Proposition 12 kicks in July 1. Nobody really knows what's, how that will impact the, the wholesale pork market. Uh, longer term, though, there's some bullish things, some things to really be excited about. And what are some of the things you're excited about? Well, we're, we're expecting a, a contraction in sow numbers. In fact, uh, it's been announced by Smithfield. Uh, we believe other major producers will be reducing the sow herd. And we're watching prices in China very closely. My sources are telling me that African swine fever remains a horrible issue in China. Uh, hog prices in China are flat line right now, uh, but if they start turning sharply higher, and we think they will by the end of summer, you could see some renewed export business uh, from the Chinese, say by the fourth quarter of this year. Things to watch for domestically. Dennis, record high cash cattle price, record high retail beef price. Is that pushing consumers into pork? Well, we're seeing a, a, a change. Uh, domestic pork demand has been very poor so far this year, but retailers are finally lowering pork prices, uh, two for one type giveaways. Uh, and this is stimulating renewed interest at the domestic level, yes. Dennis, you mentioned we've got a pop in an overall bear market happening right now in the lean hog futures. How are you managing that risk? You putting puts on for the fall? Yeah, we're selling uh, summer futures right now. We're trying to sell futures and we're trying to buy put options. And this is all ahead of July 1. Uh, the, the date that Proposition 12 is supposed to kick into place, we just don't know what is going to happen. So uh, uncertainty is never good for a market. So we are actively trying to get some hedges established in the summer hog market. All right, lots to watch for. Dennis Smith, Archer Financial Services, thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you. On Friday, USDA released their June World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, their updates to the monthly balance sheet. In corn, there was no change to the area planted or harvested for this month. New crop ending stocks were raised 35 million bushels as old crop exports were dropped 50 million bushels. New crop ending stocks finished then higher 35 million bushels at 2.257 billion bushels. The season average farm price was unchanged at $4.80. In soybeans, again, no change to yield or planted area. Old crop exports, however, were lowered 15 million bushels, which then raised new crop beginning stocks 15 million bushels and saw new crop ending stocks finish higher by 15 million bushels as well. In wheat, the all wheat stocks were up 6 million bushels to 1.665 billion bushels on the strength of higher than expected production in hard red winter wheat. Yield was clocked at 44.9 bushels per acre and the farm price was lowered 30 cents per bushel to 770. The next report will be Wednesday, July 12th. Now, Colby Ag Tech, brought to you by Copperhead Ag Products. Visit copperheadag.com for more information. I heard they had a new product introduction at Apple, so I knew I didn't have to ask Chad Colby twice to take a look at it and tell us what might be of interest to folks on the farm. Every June, Apple has their Worldwide Developer Conference, and at that conference, they share what's new in hardware, but really on the software side, give you that vision of where they're going. They also share their newest operating system, iOS 17. Now, it's coming out in September, but there's a lot of enhancements I wanted to talk about. 
Like you see here, FaceTime gets some enhancements, that allows you to email those off. They also added Apple Journal, which I'm pretty intrigued with. All your photos, your notes, it all goes across all platforms. I really like this idea and a new concept. Another big one that I've been waiting for for years, offline maps. And yes, Snoopy, you're right. When you're there, you can also send notes when you get to your location, which is pretty cool. They've got a great new feature. Take your phone in landscape mode and put it in standby mode. Put your baseball scores, all kinds of cool stuff. And look what they did to voicemail. As you're physically leaving a voicemail, you can see it in real time. Those enhancements go out to the tablet, as you see, the watch, if you use that hardware as well. And speaking of hardware, they unveiled their biggest and lightest MacBook Air. So for those of you who like that lightweight, small laptop, they've made some huge changes and for the first time a 15-inch size, which even for myself, that's something I kind of had my eye on in the past. My ecosystem consists of the latest model MacBook, which I need to edit videos like this, and three screens. But the technology I'm going to share with you now marvels the same thing you may have thought in 2007 when Apple rolled out the first iPhone. Maybe this is something I'll never use. This is called the Apple Vision Pro. And what it is, it's a goggle. Um, I would say it's certainly part virtual reality, right? You can see here with this woman that's using her pupils to open up apps. And this stuff works. This isn't pie-in-the-sky stuff. It also has what's called AR, augmented reality, and that means you can see through the goggles and participate, whether it's recording like you see here of this gentleman's daughter. You could even record in 3D. It's pretty neat stuff. Now, look, I understand new technology, but you also have to sit back and start to understand why is it developed and what is it going to do? What's it going to change? And in the business world or even at my desk, I'd love to get rid of these three monitors, right? I'd love to have something more portable. And look at this. This person here opens up Messenger, then is working on a presentation, takes a picture out of a text message, throws it into a presentation, and then guess what? It gets a FaceTime call with her colleagues. This is pretty neat stuff. I can't help but think about what it would be like for Angelo and Ryan to edit This Week in Agribusiness with technology like this. It's coming in 2024 at a price point of $3,500, and we know it'll get cheaper than that in the future, but be sure to check it out. For This Week in Agribusiness, I'm Chad Colby. Uh, I'm not so sure about a $3,500 set of goggles. Chad has led me down that primrose path a couple of times into new technology. I might just wait on this. Despite the fact he was making the comparison to me the other day that, you know, some of those early cell phones were 2,500, 3,000 or more. Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness, where we continue our series on the Ag States of America. We've been hearing from you how much you enjoy this series. Well, Charlie Barron's brings you another episode, this one from Wisconsin, where they make everything from faucets to fire trucks, but their farms are crucial too, of course. The United States of America can be very different from one state to another, but one thing every state has in common is agriculture. Hey everyone, I'm Charlie Behrens, and welcome to Agricultural States of America. We're gonna test your knowledge about the agriculture of different states and hopefully give you a bit more appreciation for the great things farmers are producing across the country. Today, we're starting off with my home state and America's dairy land, Wisconsin. All right, so when you think of Wisconsin, what do you think of? Aside for beer and cheese and people wearing cheese while drinking beer. How about cranberries? Now, believe it or not, Wisconsin is the top producer of cranberries in the United States. In fact, the cranberry is native to Wisconsin, and it's the state's leading crop in terms of acreage and value. Now, today, Wisconsin grows more than five and a half million barrels of cranberries each year, which is more than half the entire U.S. cranberry crop. That's a lot of cranberries. Now, cranberries have a ton of health benefits. They're loaded with antioxidants, they support heart health, they prevent UTIs, 
which may be TMI, but now you know. And of course, what cranberries are probably best known for, they make a great chaser for your vodka. Hey, speaking of vodka, did you know that you can make vodka out of potatoes? And speaking of potatoes, that crop grows on 71,000 acres of Wisconsin land. Now, when most people think of potatoes, they think of Idaho, which is fair. But Wisconsin not only grows potatoes, they're also third in the nation in total potato production. That means Wisconsin is taking home the bronze medal for potato production in the US, which isn't bad if you ask me. But let's get back to the other crops Wisconsin's taking home the gold in. Wisconsin is number one in corn silage, snap peas, and ginseng. And if you're not familiar with ginseng, have no fear, Charlie is here. Like cranberries, ginseng is also native to Wisconsin, and it's only found in wooded areas with plenty of shade. Kind of like me during summer. I burn easily. Ginseng also has a lot of medical benefits, including lowering blood sugar, lowering cholesterol, and helping with erectile dysfunction. So as you can see, ginseng is really raising the, uh, the bar. And now for the moment your charcuterie boards have been waiting for. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Let's talk about cheese. Crowned as America's dairy land, Wisconsin has over 8,000 licensed dairy farms and 1.27 million dairy cows. Together, they produce over 3 billion pounds of cheese each year, or roughly 26% of our nation's total cheese production. And that just skims the surface. Seriously? You know, like that little milk pun for you, skims? What's wrong, no Gouda? Too cheesy? Okay, fine. No, I don't want to milk it, okay? You know, let's just, I cheddar cut it out, you know? I don't want to curd your enthusiasm, so. All right, I'm done. Beyond the dairy cows, Wisconsin is also home to roughly 290,000 head of beef cattle. That way you can have your Culver's Butter Burger and drink your concrete mixer too. Other Wisconsin livestock includes hogs, broiler chickens, and eggs, which translates to brats, wings, and mayo. Some other crops that need their props are oats, carrots, tart cherries, sweet corn for processing, and of course, maple syrup. I bet you didn't know that the Wisconsin state tree is the sugar maple. Yeah, what can I say? Wisconsinites love tapping trees, and mostly kegs, but also trees. Oh, and can't forget to mention the three million acres of corn and two million acres of soybeans grown in Wisconsin each year, plus hay, lots of hay. And between the carrots, and the corn and the hay. I mean, if you think about it, Wisconsin is a very nice place to be a Clydesdale. <laughs> well, that's all the time we have for now, but you can always go to pivotbio.com slash AG states and explore more agriculture from your favorite states and test your knowledge to win great prizes and more. All right, we'll see you next time in the agricultural states of America. Well now, Charlie took a turn or two there I wasn't expecting. In his Ag States of America, you can follow this series online as well, pivotbio.com slash ag states. Oh, he didn't talk about uh, Alice in Dairyland, for example. In the past, he's mentioned some of the queens, the commodity queens that they have in various states. Well, Alice in Dairyland is not a queen. She's a full-time employee of the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture and spends a whole year traveling around the state and to other states, too, extolling the virtues of the agriculture industry of Wisconsin. Uh, Taylor Schaefer is serving in that role right now, full-time employee. She's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, but I believe she's the 75th Alice in Dairyland, and I came across these statistics. Alice in Dairyland during the year will do 80 television interviews, 200 radio interviews, 1,000 social media posts, 60 print articles, uh, 200 tailored speeches as well. So the lady who serves in that role is very busy. Oh, and I should mention, uh, Wisconsin Farm also produced our broadcast buddy, Orion Samuelson, who hails from the Kickapoo Valley of Wisconsin. So what's going on in the market for farmland? Mark Stock knows he watches that from Big Iron Auctions. Mark is coming up next on This Week in Agribusiness. This Week in Agribusiness, serving America's most essential industry is brought to you by Case IH.
Welcome back to This Week in Agribusiness. Max, we've seen two years of prices of everything being volatile, and the question is always, what's it worth? How do we get that answer? Uh, Mark Stock is a man we rely on quite often for a little bit of that input, to be sure, at Big Iron Auctions. You know, there's that yellow shirt. You know a Big Iron man is in the house, or woman, because you attire everybody in yellow, don't you? We sure do. Yellow's our color, and uh, you know we've got a lot of reps all across the country. Hey, let's uh, find out a little bit about what's going on in the market for land. With all of the negatives there and the sentiment of farmers down a little bit, is it hurting at all the value of farmland? So far, we haven't seen that. Interest rates, uh, everybody always concerned about what interest rates will do to farmland. But in the properties that we have been selling, Max, uh, money is still coming to the table in the form of cash. So uh, visiting with some of the ag land lenders, uh, they have a lot of customers that are expanding their operations with last year's revenue. Do, will we see that change? Eventually it probably will. And will six and seven and eight percent interest have a bearing on the price of your farmland? It probably will over time. So if somebody's thinking about selling land, it's probably a good time to do it sooner than later. Equipment, used equipment still quite strong? Used equipment is still strong. Uh, supply chains are starting to get replenished. So uh, anticipation of some sort of a correction is probably being realistic. Uh, if you drive by an implement dealership yard now, you're starting to see more uh, tractors and combines and planters. But the auctions that we've been having here, Max, are retirement sales that uh, are featuring a lot of late model, low houred items. And those items that are very well cared for are still topping the markets. Caring for that equipment and, and how it appears, it is important in the resale, is it not? Uh, totally. Uh, you know, a quick saying is if you take care of your equipment, it will take care of you when you want to sell it. If you kind of beat it up when you're using it, it's going to beat you back when you want to sell it. So, yes, it's important to uh, do routine maintenance. Uh, get those inspections at your local implement dealership. Uh, document that inspection. And uh, if you have some places to keep it under a roof, to keep it out of the uh, bright uh, sunlight, uh, that helps immensely as well. We're looking forward a couple of months from now to the show at Rantoul, Illinois. We know Big Iron is a platinum sponsor of the half century of progress. You've been there before, haven't you? Oh, I've been there, Max. I've watched you MC the parade. I've uh, seen the golf courts and the ATVs running all over the place. It, uh, it's like Grand Central Station on that runway. So we're looking forward to being there. Uh, we're going to have a lot of yellow buckets, folks, uh, so if you need a bucket, come on by the big iron booth and display. But we're also uh, going to be sponsoring the tractor pull right along with you, Max, so we're uh, honored to do that as well. And uh, we're building uh, a big sale that will take place just the week after, and we've already got some tractor collections that people have asked us to sell uh, in conjunction with the, the Farm Progress Show. But we're going to have these tractors on display uh, at Half Century of Progress as well. So if anybody has a collection they would like to sell or even one tractor they'd like to sell after that show and they want to display it there or have it in our brochure, uh, you've got till about the middle of July to contact us to get those items listed for that special auction. Quickly, the best way to reach you. Uh, go to our website, bigiron.com, and there you'll have all kinds of different access, uh, phone numbers, and uh, email addresses to give us a call. We look forward to seeing you soon in your yellow shirts of Big Iron. Take care, sir. Greg Solier now brings us his farm weather forecast for the week ahead, presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Some of us have been pondering for a few days just what all of this smoke might mean to crop production after all is said and done. It would vary, of course, by location and by crops. But Greg, I noted this week at Quebec Farms, Kirkville, New York, they were talking about their yield surely will be down. Sweet corn, yep. onions, tomatoes, strawberries. And this will be probably an ongoing problem. Uh, smoke either up aloft above about seven, 8,000 feet. You have that dingy looking sky at times. Certainly sets the stage for brilliant sunrise and sunsets. But at the same time, sometimes you're able to mix down some of that smoke as we saw in the northeast of New England. Visibilities at times into the quarter of a mile category. So pretty tough situation and no real end in sight from the Canadian prairie, the boreal forest region, southeast into Quebec and Ontario. 
Ontario. In any event, back in the Pacific Northwest, pretty benign setup here. Uh, typical summer warmth across the divide country into areas of the northern Plain States region. No super hot air at all anticipated. Well, not only last week, but in the uh, days and weeks to come. Next weather system ashore that will uh, kind of deepen up a bit of a trough here. We do have some sense of organized rainfall and not get temperatures down have been frequently eastern Washington state up at around the 90 degree mark. A couple of thunderstorms and sometimes despite the downpours or the lack thereof, you do kick off fire potential lightning strikes. So this will have to be watched over the southwest Canadian prairie into the northern plains, perhaps a sprinkle as far south as northern California. We've had not only low pressure over the southwestern states, kind of some troughiness, if we will, that's been in the southeastern part of the country as well. In between, not much movement of significant weather systems. That whole atmospheric setup now forecast to resolve itself, but nonetheless, a sprinkle down into the San Joaquin Valley and points westward. A couple of dry base thunderstorms, desert southwest, and the warmth in typical uh, early to mid-June heat. Nothing out of control as far north as sections of Nebraska. Marginal improvement to some of the drought issues in the plains of late. This weather system kind of retrogrades back into the uh, cold waters of the Pacific here later in the week. A couple of thunderstorms get going into parts of Nebraska, southward through Oklahoma and Texas. So, Max, uh, despite the wide range of rain amounts and excess of rain, there's been, again, some modest improvement to the drought on the central and southern plains. Yeah, you've referenced central Nebraska. Of course, we will be there toward the end of the week, and I'm just wondering how warm it might be. Uh, well, nothing unusual for this point into early to mid-June. High pressure and control. We've got a weather system closed off here across the eastern Corn Belt. Yeah, there's been some reports of rain. Yeah, there's a little more rain over the course of the weekend, and yes, there's more rain down the line here, and we're going to keep an eye on the tropics as well, mind you, in the next 10 days to two weeks. Anyway, some shower activity for the eastern Corn Belt. Cool up towards the Sioux. Seasonal temperatures here. Warm back uh, west of the Missouri, nothing out of control. Next weather system in sight along this boundary, warm air moving northward, thunderstorm clusters from Minnesota down to the Ohio Valley. So again, some semblance of more typical normalized June rain on the maps and charts. Uh, heat and humidity, what do you expect for June across uh, Texas? A couple of thunderstorms in uh, West Texas. Cotton boy, some of those have been all or nothing or late along the Gulf Coast areas as well. Cooler high pressure into the Ozarks heading towards the early part of the week. Later on, that weather system kicks out of the southwest, sets up the th thunderstorm activity over the central and southern plains into the Ozarks. Pretty quiet weather pattern over the deep south and southeastern sections of the country. Temperatures as well in check. Your reference to the tropics has some of us wondering. Yeah. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that here in the next 10 days to two weeks and take a look at it in the longer range forecast. Here's this early week weather system, shower activity and pretty good coverages and probably some spots that might even pick up uh, an inch worth of rain into the uh, areas of the northeast of New England. Visibility is briefly improving until we get this weather system to move on through. Jet stream winds come in from the west and northwest will drive in not only shower activity, but probably more smoke Again, an ongoing situation and story across the Canadian prairie to the northeast of New England with time. There's more rain. You don't need any more of it across the Carolinas with showers and thunderstorms, but there's been drought relief down through Florida. Cooler, drier air temporarily so into areas west of the Mississippi before some heat and humidity build on up. Pressures lowering here across the Gulf. Some tropical rains, so additional showers and thunderstorms. The rainy season underway in the Sunshine State. Greg Sonia is back with his extended farm weather forecast for the country presented by Pivot Bio Proven 40. Predictable, productive, weatherproof. Turn to a better nitrogen. Turn to Pivot Bio Proven 40. Learn more at pivotbio.com. So who gets the rain of the week ahead? We find out right now. Put it on the map for us, sir. We shall, and it is much needed. Welcome and highly beneficial rain across uh, the uh, northern parts of the Corn Belt early in the week. Another weather system, middle part of the week for the western sections. And with time, an inch across the areas of the I-70 corridor and southward. Don't need any more of it, but we'll take it one to two inches over the deep south and southeastern states, including some tropical downpours. Nothing for now in the high plains areas, a spot or two of quarter to half inch of the Pacific Northwest. That moisture arriving, if you bring some heat in with it, that could really bring the crops along. With the, the arrival of summer, will it be warmer? It, it'll be warmer, nothing out of control, no extreme temperatures. You know, this time of the year, we can push 90 to about the I-70 corridor. That's normal, that's average, a little below average up through the Canadian Prairie, Pacific Northwest. So the southeastern half of the country, a little bit above average as we welcome into summertime, a little more humidity. The jet stream pattern is favorable for ripples to come along it, and we get some pretty good coverage moisture over the entire 
Corn Belt. Throw into this system here, we anticipate something out of the Gulf into the western areas of uh, uh, Louisiana. West of the Mississippi means a channeling effect of some of that moisture in the Corn Belt too. So a win-win, warm temperatures and moisture on the way. That could be very interesting. Friend of mine in Indiana said a few days ago, I've had the drought. I'd rather have one in May and June than have one in July and August. And we do not foresee ongoing dryness and drought. Told you this is not the way the whole summertime season goes. So uh, while temperatures are up and they're up a little bit elevated at the Ohio Valley, again, this jet stream pattern is very favorable to set up additional showers and thunderstorms across areas of the Pacific Northwest. More so, entire Corn Belt locales into the northeast New England, drying out across the deep south and southwestern parts of the country. How about the first week of July? Warm? Uh, warm, nothing out of control here as it applies to much of the heartland. Uh, maybe the I-70 Ohio Valley corridor on southward above average readings up to the Canadian Prairie. The jet stream is still southwest and northeast. This, by the way, limits uh, the monsoon setup over the southwestern part of the country. But at the same time, we brew up a couple of more systems. Again, we think here and back to the Gulf, El Nino will not impact the tropical weather season. So moisture over the southeastern part of the country. What weather continues on as well over much of the northern and central Corn Belt locales back into the Plain states with additional drought relief as we see it. And again, the Pacific Northwest back into above average moisture. Little if any organized rains over the southwestern part of the country. So a disappointing monsoon season to start things off. Next on this week in agribusiness, it's Max's Tractor Shed. Spotlighting another great American tractor. Going to be a lot of red equipment in the spotlight of the week ahead at Grand Island, Nebraska. And this weekend, I'm sharing four of mine. Max's Tractor Shed, brought to you by Mystic Lubricants. Mystic Lubricants are made to make it last. Every now and then, I'm asked by somebody, well, what tractors do you have? And it occurred to me that over the more than two decades that I've been featuring old tractors on television, I'm not sure that I've shown all of mine. We're doing that this weekend ahead of the Red Power Roundup that takes place at Grand Island of the week ahead. First of all, here's my little 404. This tractor is the only one of the four that I own that came out of the plant at Louisville, Kentucky. I was in about second grade, 150 miles or so west of there when this 404 was made by International Harvester. But this is the tractor that started it all for me, more ways than one. Mom and Dad took delivery of this 1953 Super H the same year they got me. And you can see the Super H in downtown Chicago, where we photographed it many, many years ago. That's a story of its own. Then here's the Super M. This isn't the exact tractor that we had, but it's a 1953 model. And here's the 560, restored a few years ago by the FFA chapter of Prairie Central High School, Fairbury, Illinois. Very proud of that one, too a tractor that dad once had. Here's this week's Big Iron Report now. Let's check in with Mark Stock again. Well, Max, we're in the middle of June and we've got phenomenal equipment selling this week on BigIron.com. The Jared Beal Retirement Sale by Brule, Nebraska features a John Deere 680 Combine and a John Deere 8285R Mechanical Front Tractor. Kevin Kaiser is retiring by Hartley, Iowa. They've got a 2012 John Deere S550 Combine and a John Deere 8260R Mechanical Front Tractor. June the 14th, e and Oil Field Services out of Munn, Colorado will sell a 2015 John Deere 544K wheel loader and a 2018 John Deere 6130M mechanical front tractor with a loader. On Thursday, June the 15th, by Spalding, Nebraska, the Robert Leslie Estate Sale features 100 items, a 2022 John Deere 8R340 mechanical front tractor with less than 100 hours. Outstanding equipment plus 18 John Deere, Ford, and Ferguson collector tractors. And on Friday, June the 16th, the Zimmerman Estate Auction by Compton, Illinois, featuring 65 high quality items. Bobcat T870 track loader, 2019 case 580 Super N 4x4 loader backhoe, and many more items. Auction every day of the week, next week, on BigIron.com and SullivanAuctioneers.com. 
Our FFA chapter tribute is brought to you by Pioneer. Developing new generations of seed innovations for new generations of farmers. Pioneer, what's next happens here. We're learning about the future of FFA and those next generation of agricultural leaders. And this week, we're talking with Anthony Taylor. He's serving as the Indiana FFA State Treasurer. And Anthony, I understand we're just a few weeks away from convention. What have been the highlights of your year of service so far? I really enjoyed our chapter visit season. Um, it was really cool to go out and visit with some chapters all over the state of Indiana. So I actually had the northernmost states as well as the southernmost states um, or chapters in the state. And it was a really fun experience to just really broaden my horizon of FFA chapters that are out there. Probably logged a lot of miles getting around this past year to see students, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And now, of course, convention is around the corner. How, how involved have you been in the planning of convention? So we each have our own subtasks, and one of my biggest ones is the master supply list. So I have to gather everything everybody needs for their sessions, as well as everything that we need um, just generally for convention. And so that's one of my biggest tasks, and it has taken a lot of time and a lot of hours to really make sure we get that list completed and make sure everybody has everything that they need. So that's been one of my biggest things that I've been planning recently. Well, that is what FFA provides in terms of leadership experience. And Anthony, I'm also curious, you had the chance to do some CDEs in high school, career development events. What were those? Um, so I did the welding CDE. It was one of my favorites, but I did a couple others in forestry and horticulture as well. But it sounds like welding might have stuck a little bit. You're hoping to make that your career? It did. So my freshman year, I started welding and it carried in um, all the way through my senior year. But my junior and senior year, I had the opportunity to take welding classes. And that's really where my career is focused into. Well, we wish you the best of luck going forward. Have fun at convention. Anthony Taylor, Indiana State FFA Treasurer. In the week ahead, we'll get a look at crop conditions in the state of Nebraska. We're headed right to central Nebraska. We may have a chance to see some of you folks in that part of the world. It's what they call the Red Power Roundup that'll be taking place at Fawner Park in Grand Island, Nebraska. And we'll run into this gentleman there, I'm sure. Author and photographer of the farm equipment industry history, Lee Clauncher, joining us this weekend. You're going to be there, right? Absolutely, Max. I'm sort of en route, actually. So, yes, I'm headed that way. Looking forward to it because we'll get to be on the program together. We might tell folks a little bit about that on both Thursday and Friday at Grand Island. We'll be uh, appearing together, but the real stars will be uh, that iron around us. Absolutely. And uh, it's going to be great. Max and I will be in the Heartland Center. We've got... Uh, some time to talk and we've got uh, we're set up so we're going to be projected on the big screen which can be a lot of fun um, but as max points out the star of red power is always the tractors so what we're going to do is uh, on each day talk through some of the machines on the floor talk about the history of those machines we'll get a few stories about the machines and then talk about how that machine fit into ih history so over the course of two days people are kind of walk through the whole history of Farmall through the eyes of these really interesting, fantastic machines that Howard's gathered for the show. You're saying machines. Is it more than tractors? Uh, it is. There's a couple of things that are real interesting. One is a motor cultivator. I think very few people have seen one. I actually have not had my hands on one. Can't wait to see that. That's a really important piece of equipment in the Farmall history. And uh, Howard is actually personally uh, delivering that as we speak. He went and picked it up today, I believe. Howard is one so of the collectors? The, He's one of the collectors? Howard, Howard is the director of Red Power magazine. He's the head of the club. So um, he he's organizing a lot of these things and went and picked up the motor cultivator. For someone who's never been to a Red Power Roundup, what is it? What all do you see there? You know, it's a, I think it's really like a big family reunion to be in some ways, but really the star of the show is tractors. And they gather a lot of really interesting tractors in history, and you can walk around and see them and experience them. But there's a lot of people that have um, 
booths and things where you can visit. You can stop and get food. There'll be music. There'll be entertaining presentations. So it's just a great event uh, for anyone who wants to kind of relive those tractor moments in their life. But if uh, if I'm not mistaken, and, and if it hasn't changed from the past, there's much more than tractors there. You'll often see International Harvester combines, trucks, refrigerators, firearms, right? Yes, you are right. It is everything IH, not just tractors. That is 100%. And this year, uh, particularly the refrigerators, they'll have a nice display. Um, and you bet things like the rifles, which almost nobody knows about or not that many people do. It's there'll be somebody there with a display where you can learn a ton. It's a reminder of how big and expansive and diverse that company was. I'll be telling I'll be speaking on Friday night at the Red Power Roundup. I'll have a story about an international harvester air conditioner. They did make those. Well, interesting. <laughs> interesting. I'm looking forward to that. It was very, very much a part of uh, my early career, as a matter of fact. I'll tell that story. Lee Clauncher, we look forward to seeing you in Grand Island, sir. It'll be a treat. I'm looking forward to it, Max. Thanks so much for having me on this morning. Thank you. Uh, it's Red Power Roundup, Grand Island, Nebraska, Fauner Park. And yes, uh, Lee Clauncher will be there with us. And uh, I know many of his fans, Mike, look forward to meeting him personally and, and finding out a little more about his new book that's coming out. There's going to be a line of tractors headed to Grand Island. A lot of that red paint on the interstate this weekend, Max. A lot of red. I will have a story to tell, though, when I speak out there about the John Deere 4020, but oh. I better save that. Okay. <laughs> You've got to be in attendance to hear yeah. the story, I suppose. I know, I know folks will be asking about Mike, asking about Orion, so I'll tell them. I'll update them Thank on you. you and what you're up to. We hope you'll join us next weekend here for This Week in Agribusiness. Have a great week. Be safe. So long, everyone. This Week in Agribusiness is brought to you by Case IH. This Week in Agribusiness is produced by OMAX Communication in association with 22 Creative Group. We invite you to visit us online at agbizweek.com.